Welcome to Commotion Labs Fundamentals for Startups. I'm your host, Deborah Bushney, Marketing Manager here at Commotion. Fundamentals for Startups is our regular lecture series open to anyone interested in learning about entrepreneurship or building a startup. Each week we feature experts from various fields who bring you insights and inspiration to give you the opportunity to ask questions. All sessions are recorded and archived on Commotion's website. For our full schedule and to register for future fundamentals, please visit bit.ly forward slash Commotion Fundamentals. Commotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator program hosting early stage startups from both inside and outside the UW community. We are committed to nurturing and enabling startup success through critical infrastructure, training, mentoring, and networking. And we do this without taking equity or IP. We operate out of three locations on campus, each with its own industry focus. The life sciences and hardware incubators, which are both in Fluke Hall, and our technology incubator based here in Startup Hall. If you're a founder looking for somewhere to thrive, we'd love to talk to you. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to mention next week's event when Kenny Lee, co-founder and CEO of iGen, will present The Power of Purpose-Driven Startups, How Sustainability Drives Innovation. Today, Catherine Sizov is here to present Catching the Low-Hanging Fruit, My Candid Journey Starting a Company from Idea to Series A. Catherine studied molecular biology at the University of Pennsylvania, where she picked up the stat that 40% of food is wasted before it's consumed. She used her love of bio and application-based science to start her company, Strella, in, founded in 2019. Catherine will take live questions, or take questions, sorry, in the live event space and also via the YouTube chat, so get your questions ready. And now I will turn the event over to Catherine. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really great to meet everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and before I dive into it, I uh, would like to say that I'll talk for a little bit of time. I'll give you a little bit of background on myself, Strella, how I started, uh, where I'm currently at, um, but would absolutely love to open it up for questions that you guys might have. So please feel free to ask me absolutely anything. Um, I'm an open book. I'm here to kind of help you in your entrepreneurship journey or if there's anything that you can learn today uh, through any question that you're interested in, I would love to answer it. So um, would would love to mostly make this a conversation with you guys to talk about the stuff that you're truly interested in. But before I do that, I'll introduce myself a little bit and talk about Strella. So I, I'm Catherine, uh, like the intro, I studied molecular biology at Penn um, and I was supposed to go to graduate school. So I was on a neuroscience track um, and I began applying for graduate school around my junior year of college, but something wasn't quite sitting right uh, with me in my heart. I knew deep down I wouldn't be super fulfilled uh, kind of sitting at a lab bench for another eight years. And so I started thinking about other things that I could do, i.e. I started procrastinating uh, to get into grad school. And uh, at some point uh, in all the kind of random reading I was doing, I read that 40% of food is wasted before it's consumed, uh, which I thought was an absolutely ridiculous number, something that definitely doesn't belong in the 21st century. And then after that, I felt super guilty because I realized that I'm one of those people that just goes to the grocery store and takes it for granted that I can go there and have a beautiful selection of fresh fruits and veggies and meat and seafood uh, all year round. Uh, so have just perfect access to a ton of stuff. And so that kind of led me on a journey of uh, skipping class, going to farms and eventually starting Strella. Uh, I met my co-founder, Jay, at a networking event uh, in Philly, um, and he knew all about apples, and uh, we eventually uh, started working together. And today we're about 17 folks, uh, so we're pretty heavy on the, on the nerd side, if you will. So lots of electrochemists, post-harvest physiologists, molecular biologists, uh, people that are really passionate about food um, and turning technology into something that an industry can use. 
So the food supply chain uh, has a food waste problem, obviously. And the reason that uh, we think this happens is twofold. First of all, there's very little data in the food supply chain. So we know a ton of people that can drive down their orchard in their F-150 and say, I know when these apples are ready to come off the tree. And their intuition is super right, uh, but that information can't really be passed down to anybody else within that organization. And also ultimately, uh, it can't be passed down to the next person, like the grocery store, for example. And the second problem is that everybody's siloed. So the way that I look at the food supply chain is it's one giant game of hot potato that's being played with perishable products, uh, lots of peas. And as you can imagine, that's not really the best uh, thing for when you're talking about waste. So when thinking about how to solve uh, this big problem, um, I thought, what kind of data would be the most useful in this equation and came up with, well, perishability, right? We're talking about perishables. So what we do at Strella is we use shelf life data to make smarter decisions in the food supply chain. So actually, we started in the apple and pear industry on the supplier side. And that's uh, the reason that most of us live in Seattle right now, because 80 percent of all the apples that we eat are actually produced in Washington state in two uh, cities called Yakima and Wenatchee, if you guys have ever been east. So fun fact, an apple in a grocery store can be over a year old, and that's because uh, fruits can be stored for a pretty long time. So whenever you go with your friends and family to pick apples, that's when all the apples are coming off the trees. But then you can buy an American apple in June, July, and even the following year, and that's because it's stored. So apples are stored in these massive storage rooms. Each one is filled with millions of pieces of fruit. And right now it's kind of a giant guessing game of behind which door is the most ripe apple. Um, and people rely a lot on their intuition. So a lot of these growers are fifth generation growers who know, you know, Farmer Joe's got really good Granny Smith apples versus the guy across the street, for example. But at the end of the day, it's kind of a giant guessing game um, and it's very, very not data driven. So what we've done is we've created a sensor technology that can predict the ripeness of fruits and veggies. Uh, so basically, if you've ever put an unripe banana next to a ripe one, you see that it ripens a lot faster than if it was by itself. And this is because fruits talk to each other as they're ripening. Um, they basically tell each other, hey, I'm ripening, and then they make everybody else around them ripen at the same time. And so we've developed a sensor that allows us to measure these uh, emissions in fruit very, very specifically. Um, and then we use that information to make a smarter decision about what to do uh, with apples. So when thinking about a solution to the food waste problem, I you know, my background's in molecular bio. So I was thinking a lot about the fact that, you know, food is is an organism, right? A lot of perishable products are living or were living and we don't necessarily treat them as such. We treat them like commodity objects. And can we think about a way to kind of cross that cross that bridge between an organism and a commodity? And so this sensor technology was the first step. We have intellectual property around uh, the, the sensor mechanism that allows us to be super, super specific. So we don't measure any pesticides or chemicals or anything that is in the environment except those little communications uh, between fruits and veggies. And then we use that information to basically optimize inventory. So we can tell an apple supplier like two months ahead of time that their apples are going to go bad. And this gives them plenty of time to send it down the supply chain um, and have folks eat it and consume it before it goes bad. So we're very focused on being proactive um, and making that decision before anything actually changes in quality. To date, we've monitored over 2 billion apples and pears, a huge percentage of which are actually in Washington state. Um, and on average, we save our customers about $35,000 per room per year. So we operate on kind of a SaaS model um, where we charge a subscription service for access to our data. And we recently signed a big distribution deal with uh, a company in our space uh, to expand globally. Uh, one of the reasons that I initially actually picked uh, the Apple market is because as a startup founder, I could literally drive there. Um, so Yakima and Wenatchee are pretty close to Seattle. Uh, it's about a two hour drive if you're going fairly quickly. Um, and all of the customers are uh, driving distance. And so when I was thinking about what I could do while still in college or even just out of college, I was thinking about the literal feasibility of driving to customers. And so the Apple market was a was a great one. 
So we started on the supply side, but then like, as soon as these apples are taken out of these storage rooms, they're put on a truck and then they're sent to the grocery store. And at that point, we kind of lose visibility and we're like, well, what happened to the apple after it left the supplier? What, what comes next? So we followed it uh, down the chain to the retailer. So a retailer uh, basically receives a black box of apples into their distribution center. And they're totally not experts whatsoever in, in apples because they're managing hundreds of thousands of different pieces of inventory. And so uh, they're trying to make their best guess on whether the apples are good enough or not good enough. And the way they do that is with manual checks. So every time a truck arrives, a person will go in and take a look at the apples. And guess what? If the apples aren't super great, they will literally be just dumped on the side of the road. So if a retailer is like, I don't really want these apples, they're not great enough, there's really nothing else that the truck driver can do except just dump them. So sometimes you'll see that happening. Like if you're uh, driving down a rural road, you'll just see a bunch of fruit like running on the side of the highway. So we were like, this doesn't really make too much sense. Uh, so let's try to come up with a better solution. So we created something called automated quality management um, and it works in two parts. So the first thing we do is we go back to the supplier and we say, hey supplier, um, let's make sure that the apples you're sending to the grocery store aren't going to get rejected and dumped. Um, so we know which pallets of fruit have the right shelf life, the right color, the right specs basically for a retailer to accept. And so we're gonna work with you to make sure you're sending the right product. And then secondarily, we're gonna do basically triage within the supply chain of the retailer. So imagine you go to the emergency room. You don't get treated based on the time that you walked into the door. You get treated based on how bad your wounds are, right? Well, right now that's not happening in the food supply chain. So it's just first in, first out. So what we're doing is we're operating like an emergency room where if we see a bunch of fruit coming in that isn't doing super hot, we make sure that that gets sent to the grocery store as quickly as possible so it can be purchased and consumed before it goes bad. Um, we're able to reduce uh, the store level food waste by about 50%. And we're also able to uh, improve the quality by five times. So we're able to reduce that instance of a mealy or mushy apple on the store shelf by about five times. Every time you bite into a mushy apple, uh, you basically don't repurchase from that store for an average of five weeks. Uh, so we're working with uh, some pretty big retailers. Uh, we're, our major work is actually with Target right now. And then we're beginning trials with uh, two other uh, top 15 American retailers shortly. Our next step was basically to say, OK, cool. Uh, we followed an apple down the supply chain. Can we do that with other things like bananas or other commodities? Uh, so we, st we went uh, directly into bananas. So I'm sure you guys have noticed that when you go to the grocery store, the bananas are kind of green. Um, and that's not super great for sales uh, because if you have a green banana on your store shelf, you're actually selling about 30% fewer bananas than if they were all uh, nice and yellow. Um, but the problem is that banana ripening is a super subjective uh, metric right now. So there's literally, you bring in green bananas into your uh, retail distribution center and then you ripen them to turn yellow. And there's a dude that walks into that ripening room every day and is like, are these bananas more green or less green than I expected? And then based on their, mostly their intuition, uh, they ripen the bananas. But it's obviously, again, super duper subjective um, and not, not the best uh, quantifiable uh, way to do things. So what we do is we help improve the color of bananas uh, with our sensor technology. So basically what we do is we put sensors in those rooms. We can tell how ripe the bananas are and how ripe they're going to be. And then we have this little app here that's on a tablet um, that tells a ripener how to adjust the conditions of the room to get that perfect yellow banana every time. In the future, this will all be automated. So basically anyone can just push a button um, and you get a nice yellow banana at the end of a couple of days, but this is kind of our intermediate in working with customers. We're working with a top two Canadian retailer right now, and we're expanding into other folks uh, as well this year. So I'll move a little bit into the fundraising piece. So um, when I was still in college, I actually did a ton of pitch competitions. Uh, so I kind of started out just like going for every, every few hundred dollars uh, pitching. Um, and I was able to, before I graduated, 
uh, get about half a million dollars of, of equity free financing. And that basically enabled me to get to my first year of revenue uh, with my company, hire my first key folks and, and make some progress before I went out for a financing round. Um, so to date, we've raised around $11.5 million of equity financing. Um, our latest round was an $8 million Series A. Um, our investors include folks like Catapult, uh, Yamaha, um, Mark Cuban joined, uh, Google Ventures joined. Um, so always happy to talk about any kind of questions you guys have around fundraising uh, VC, VC money. And we're likely to be going out for a Series B actually in a couple months time. So I'm spending a lot of time thinking about uh, the future of the company, what the strategy is moving forward and uh, what we want to be in the next couple of years. Um, our goal in general is to go into other commodities. So basically 30% of the food waste is generated by 10 commodities. Um, and those are kind of our major targets. And they're all the stuff that we really like to eat. Like our immediate next step is avocados because we all know that when we go to the grocery store, the avocados are either way too hard or way too mushy. So uh, there's clearly a lot of work to be done there. And actually flowers is another big one because unlike the avocado that we throw into the back of our fridge, um, we actually watch flowers go bad right before our eyes. So getting their perishability right is uh, pretty important. And I just want to conclude my little presentation with the fact that I started this company um, because it's got that double bottom line. So um, I, I just don't think that I could get through the hard days of, of running a company if it was solely a profitability focused company. Um, I think everybody on my team really cares about doing something that hopefully has a positive impact in the future. Um, and so food waste is one of those things that, um, has that, that impact. Uh, the food waste, the carbon emissions on food waste are greater than that of all transportation combined. And there's absolutely no positive, uh, to food waste whatsoever. And so, uh, we believe that aligning the profitability element alongside the sustainability element helps us accelerate, uh, as quickly as we possibly can and actually make that, that really big impact. So I will leave it there. Um, please uh, feel free to ask me anything you would like. Thank you. So do we have any questions from the audience or from YouTube? In terms of effort and funding, could you break out like how much money and time you've spent in developing the product versus developing your supply chain to manufacture the product versus developing your sales channel to actually kind of bring the product to market and uh, build your customer base. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I would say that changes uh, over the the course of the company's life cycle, <laughs> but um, in, initially it was a lot of uh, lab work. I was literally pipetting things um, and doing a lot of lab work um, and uh, physical experimentation. Um, after I was able to hire folks much smarter than me on that side, I transitioned um, more towards management uh, on a daily basis. Um, supply chain is a, a pervasive problem. I would say at our total company's efforts, I would say about 15% is spent on manufacturing and supply chain efforts as we scale. So fairly significant pull there. Um, today, I would say my duties for the most part are on the sales side. So we're large enterprise B2B. You know, we have conversations with folks like Walmart. And so I spend a lot of my time um, on the sales side, especially on the retail end. Hi, um, I'm curious, since you kind of have a centralized platform, have you looked at potentially having a coordinated way to deal with the fruit that is deemed not good to sell in stores? Is that something that's um, on your radar? Totally. That's actually what I'm thinking about for a Series B, actually. So um, right now, for example, grocery stores all have a static spec uh, for, let's say, apples, for example. So if uh, Walmart buys an apple, they need it to be this this type of color, this size, 
um, this particular quality profile? Well, that's not exactly how consumer preferences work, right? Like uh, you might have a geography that's a little bit more price sensitive, for example, and doesn't really care about a little bit of green spotting on their apple versus you might have like a more fancy Seattleite who really wants that beautiful apple and is willing to pay a premium for it. And so I think what the next step looks like uh, in, in food supply chain is to kind of, instead of selling things in a static way with static specs, is to say, okay, we have a whole you know bin of fruit uh, coming from the farm. How can we allocate this based on consumer preferences and ultimately target a larger market? Um, retailers like Kroger, Walmart, all the big ones are actually pretty, pretty interested in seeing how they can get uh, more market share from communities that they typically weren't able to serve because of these kind of uh, static and inflexible things within their supply chain. Hey, um, a, a wonderful idea. I'm so impressed. It's such a such a cool technology. Um, I was wondering if um, you do your manufacturing of your sensors in house, or do you go to third parties to develop it? And what led you to that decision? Yeah. So for the sensors, the sensor IP itself is something that we developed in house. Um, so actually, basically up until now, we manufactured the sensor element uh, in-house. And the reason that we decided to do that was because we were iterating so much on the chemistry, like literally on a monthly basis, um, that, you know, doing that with a manufacturer would have caused really long turnarounds for us. So we're really focused on continuing the iteration of our product. Um, now that we're in a little bit more of a stable position, we're beginning to outsource manufacturing to other places. Also, honestly, we're starting to get to the scale where manual work in our teeny tiny lab is like not not feasible anymore. Um, so I, I think like, you know, the the thought process has always been when, when starting a startup, what's the low hanging fruit? Literally, what's the first easiest thing that I can do to get the product to market? And then now we're kind of a little bit more in a growth phase where we're trying to figure out, well, how do we do this at scale and how can I go to sleep at a somewhat reasonable hour? Um, sort of twofold. Can you talk about the importance of networking? You mentioned something about that earlier. And um, did that in any way lead to your relationship with, was it uh, AgroFresh? And maybe you can talk a little bit more about that uh, partnership. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I think in general, um, and, uh, and this relate, relates to VC as well. Uh, networking is definitely a big part of, of starting a company and, and continuing to run a company. So for example, when I went out to do uh, VC funding, I didn't know any VCs. And so that basically just meant that I had to harass every person I knew. Uh, so like my friends, my family, um, I went to the Penn Endowment office because I was like, y'all probably have some cash floating around there. So I went to everybody I knew and you kind of slowly start uh, building little threads that you can pull on. Um, and same thing with like BD, right? Um, it's going to a lot of conferences. Um, like, for example, I go to the Apple conference and not the Apple that you guys are super familiar with, but the physical Apple conference, uh, it's oftentimes held in Italy. Our business is very much a person to person business. Uh, so you have to look a grower in the eye, have a conversation with them, uh, do literally a handshake deal. Um, I would say the first year we didn't even have contract, like physical agreements. It was just the guy was like, sure, and then gave us a check. Um, so I, I definitely, you know, the world is human focused. And so uh, networking is definitely a very important uh, part of part of everything. Agrofresh, actually funny story. When I was still a student, I was like, okay, I have this idea. Um, I've like done some bench work. I've done a, a little bit of field testing. I kind of just want to give this technology to another company and go go to grad school or go do something else with my life. Um, and so I approached AgriFresh like three years ago and they were like, this is too nascent. We're not super interested, but now a couple years later, we're partnering. So pretty excited about that. It's been a long, a long uh, cycle, I guess. Thank you. Hey, Catherine, I have a question from our YouTube channel. How did you research and create the formula for food spoilage and the temperature for ripening the fruit? Yeah, so on in terms of like developing a thesis around food waste, um, that it's really just market research. So um, 
like picking up the phone or shooting a couple, not a couple, many, many emails uh, to folks in the industry and trying to get a pulse on why is food waste happening. And I think we've all read about it, but sometimes it's not entirely clear about what, like why, why, why are we wasting so much? And so it was just talking to hundreds of people um, and figuring out where the problem was. And then from there, trying to identify something that I could tackle first, um, something that I could realistically kind of a small bite-sized chunk of the market that I could address um, and kind of prove out, uh, prove out a theory with. Um, in terms of um, how we decide like our decision-making criteria, whether that's temperatures for ripening um, or it's uh, what to move when, um, it's a lot of research. So we literally have like many ripeners who we consult with. So we're all banana experts on our team, um, which is kind of funny, you never expected to do that. I'm sure my developers are, are thrilled by that as well. Um, but yeah, it's just a lot of like learning and, and, and deep diving into the subject matter. But I think, at the end of the day, my team is all foodies at heart. Um, and we just love diving into like, why are the bananas green on the grocery store shelf? Things like that. Would you mind repeating that one more time? <clears throat> I guess the question is, how much of what you previously uh, kind of analyzed transfers over to a new fruit? Maybe that's the, the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, the hardware itself, so like the sensor technology is uh, pretty much the same for those like 10 initial commodities that we're targeting. So the gases that these fruits and veggies are emitting are the same. Um, but it's basically like the software and the decision that's different. Uh, so for example, avocados are actually very similar to bananas. So we kind of have to, there we really just change our UI from yellow to green. Um, but in other commodities, it's about the decision, right? Like bananas are kind of different from apples because they're ripened um, throughout the, the food cycle, the food chain. So um, in some applications, there's a different decision to be made, but it's all software focused. Hi, thank you uh, for your talk. I appreciate it. It's, I um, used to work at another uh, R1 research institution in the state of Washington that's uh, headquartered in Pullman. And I've, I've seen them develop uh, the cosmic crisp apple and sort of how much time went into that. And, and all of the, the barriers that came to bringing that fruit onto market from developing enough trees to working with farmers and growers and distrib distributors. It was really tightly aggregated and very closely controlled. So the fact that you've been able to get in there and work with some of these people, I think really speaks to the demand that you <clears throat> have for the product. Um, what I'm curious about though, uh, is, you know, I just looked up some numbers here and I wanna talk more about funding and maybe ask you a question in general. So based on some data I saw in 2021, uh, $147 billion was raised by startups, but only 2% of that went to companies that were led by females. Um, and as a company that is led by a woman, was founded by a woman, and I think is working uh, in an industry that is predominantly dominated by men, can you talk about sort of some of the challenges you faced, um, some of the solutions you've had to come up with? And, and just to be very candid, do you think it would have been easier to raise money had you been a man? And in a sense, I feel bad about asking this question, but I feel like we need to talk about this more because these challenges still exist and I don't want them to sit in a corner in the dark. Yeah, no, uh, and please don't feel bad about asking any question. Like I said, everything is a super open book. Um, I can't necessarily say if I it would have been easier if I were a man. I'm sure that uh, one could certainly draw that conclusion, but I don't have that data set, if you will. Um, there's definitely been challenges for sure. Like I've had some awkward experiences where a VC will say something like, I'll give you a term sheet if you go on a date with my son. Um, I've had like kind of weird requests uh, all over the place like that. I've been asked like what my opinion on abortion was before purchasing my technology, which I don't think has anything to do with anything. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, the way that I look at it is, uh, first of all, no matter why someone wants to have a conversation with me, I'm going to give them my pitch. Um, and if I can help them uh, in their operation or if I can help them make money as a VC, um, then I think uh, it's a win-win for both myself and for them. So uh, that's generally the way that I look at it. Um, I certainly wish that there were more women in tech and also more women in 
in ag um, and, and in entrepreneurship as well. So, um, yeah, it's definitely, it, I mean, it's, it's, it can be definitely a rough journey for sure. I'm super grateful for having my co-founder because sometimes I'm like going through something and he, he'll like pick me up off the floor and, and kind of drag me across the finish line. But uh, ultimately, there's a lot of people that are extremely supportive and I've had some incredible mentors. Um, and I, I think that I, I'm just an optimist. So I choose to look at the bright side of things uh, uh, versus the versus the negatives. Hi. <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned a couple of times the importance of getting out into the field and seeing the farmers and the apple farmers face to face. Um, I was wondering, how did those conversations go and how were you able to convince that first group of people to give your tech a try? And then how did you um, demonstrate to them that it was being effective? Yeah, great question. So ag is, ag is a pretty archaic industry, right? Uh, so like some of the folks that we work with are literally 11th generation growers. Um, and so we do get the feedback often like, hey, I've been in business for this many years uh, and I've been relying on my gut and my grandfather relied on his gut and my father relied on his gut. Um, and so why do I need technology? Um, and so the way that we generally approach this is not to say, hey, we're some shiny startup that knows the answer to all your problems. Um, we say, look, uh, we're here to work with you, right? You have a ton of knowledge uh, on your fruit. You have a lot of information and it can be intuitive, but oftentimes it is right. Um, but you've got a lot on your plate right now. And uh, while we're no silver bullet, we can help you with a small piece of your operation and kind of take something off your plate. And so we oftentimes approach it more as a partnership than as a here's like a be all end all solution. And I think that's worked uh, pretty well in terms of initial uh, initial conversations. Um, Again, like started by asking like if my friends or my professor actually was the first person that gave me an introduction to a packer. Um, so I started a conversation that way. Um, and then honestly, it's kind of a hidden industry. No, you know, like no, no one really knows Borton and Sons or McDougal, even though uh, they're huge producers of apples. Um, and so I think um, they're not 100% used to a cold email the way that other types of businesses might be. And so we, after a lot, a lot of cold emails uh, would eventually get responses to folks. Catherine, I have a question from YouTube. Did you have to create an MVP of the sensor technology to get your initial funding or did you get funding and then develop the sensor technology? Yeah, absolutely. So I did develop an MVP and then I also had my first year of sales. So basically when I was still in school, I did a lot of bench work. Um, and so I kind of built an initial prototype, a very jank, very embarrassing prototype uh, being an undergrad. Um, and, then the, and then I put it into the field. Um, and so I tested it in a bunch of these Apple storage rooms. And that year, uh, one of the the folks I was traveling with told me, and I didn't even ask him, um, he was like, hey, like you really helped me uh, save a lot of apples this year. And I did some back of the napkin calculations and it was about $600,000 that you saved me by uh, showing me which fruit needs to move first. And that kind of, uh, that type of response was really strong and powerful. And, and I think that's when I decided A, that I wanted to pursue this very much full time out of college um, and B, kind of build up a team um, to get that initial little bit of revenue from the first year and then go out for a seed round. I, uh, I started pretty early, so I don't have like a resume, right? Like I don't have X Tesla or X uh, Microsoft or anything like that. And so I think my barrier was, uh, was a little higher because I'm like a baby that's going into pitch. And so I definitely needed to show that I had something. Going from a, uh, technologists to a CEO, what were some of the two or three big surprises you had where you said, gosh, I wish I'd known that before I started this? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. I think one of them is, uh, is definitely, and I'm sure everyone has heard this, but people are kind of the most important thing, period, right? You can have an amazing technology, um, but at the end of the day, it's people that get it commercialized, get it you know, get people excited about it. Um, and so I think people, even if you're the nerdiest company in the whole world, people are still super duper important um, and the number one thing in my opinion. Um, uh, 
I think another thing that I've I've heard a lot is, um, and and I agree with is balancing the high highs and the low lows because at the beginning it's extremely volatile and then as you keep going you realize this is a marathon and not a sprint and so learning how to manage that too. Um, I also didn't realize that starting a company is probably harder than doing a PhD. Um, so I don't know exactly <laughs> if I was necessarily uh, if if I really realized that at the beginning. A question as you were starting to collect your funding throughout the process, what was your strategy on utilizing that funding on R and D versus market growth with the MVP? Yeah, um, so that's a good question. So R and D has always been a pretty significant portion of our company, actually, which I think is fairly unique for a startup. So six out of seventeen of my folks are what I call lab coats. So like they literally wear lab coats on their uh, daily job. Um, and R&D is pretty important for us, um, especially as our company has a lot of like core IP around it. Um, so R&D has always been a pretty fundamental focus. I would say it's about 15 15% uh, 15 of our uh, total budget. Um, and we use that towards reducing COGS. Uh, we use that towards building more scalable product and we um, are looking at a, uh, building on a portfolio for other types of sensor applications in the future. I have another question, sort of related to networking. Notice that you launched in 2019 and the pandemic launched in 2020. And since you mentioned that you have a lot of handshake deals, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how that affect your pursuit of uh, partners. Yeah, definitely uh, was an interesting period of time. Um, I think in, in a lot of ways, the pandemic to some extent was positive for us because I think a lot of people realized how fragile uh, the supply chains are that we rely on on a daily basis. Like that feeling of going into a grocery store and seeing empty shelves is a little bit gut-wrenching. And then, yeah, you do start having that thought of like, uh, where does this stuff even come from and who's making it? Um, so in that way, I think it was positive. Uh, it was very hard to continue to have those kind of interpersonal uh, relationship building exercises uh, with our customers and then also ourselves. So at the time we were, I believe, four people. And so we said, okay, we're going to be each other's social circle for however long this takes. And we're not going to talk to absolutely anybody else. Um, at the time, we were the only ones in our little building. Um, and so we just uh, hunkered down and, and kept building um, by ourselves. Thank you. I have a question for YouTube. Are you also looking into cut fruits available on the shelf? If yet, if yes, how different is the strategy to avoid the waste? Yeah, so cut fruits are definitely a little bit different. Um, so by the time they're cut, the, the way that we look at it is we're trying to make, again, a proactive decision. So that's why we started pretty high up on the supply chain, so very close to the growers, because you know, by the time something gets to a grocery store, for example, or by the time something gets cut and processed, uh, there are a lot fewer decisions to be made. So for example, you could, if it's at the grocery store, you could throw it out, which, you know, kind of defeats the purpose, or you can mark it down, um, which isn't super great for a retailer. So what we try to do is we try to make decisions a little bit more upstream. So in the case of cut fruits, for example, uh, one of our applications could be deciding which fruit uh, to cut versus which fruit not to cut, based on uh, its perishability. Um, cut fruit obviously has higher margins, but um, also um, can, can have differences in quality. And so um, we could use our technology to make determinations on how to allocate fresh product uh, into different uh, lines of business. We've got another one from YouTube as well. Considering low hanging fruit from a sales biz dev point of view, have you learned any lessons you can share that helped you find early customers, adopters, either more quickly or cost effectively? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think ultimately I've learned agriculture and enterprise B2B is not really <laughs> low hanging fruit. Uh, those are two like very difficult uh, things to deal with, right? Ag being 
kind of a slow to adopt, not the most innovative, but definitely getting better industry. Um, and then also like, you know, we work with retailers, for example. So that sales cycle can be two to three years sometimes. Um, I think, um, I think the way that I look at all of this is like, basically it's like a game of statistics, a game of chance, right? So the more people that you talk to, the more people you reach out to, the more likely you are to find your first initial adopters. And your initial adopters are going to be pretty easy to identify because they're going to say, fuck yeah, I love this technology and I want to use it. Um, if you have to do anything past that, they're probably not an early adopter. So anyone that you leave a conversation with, you know, smiling about being like, wow, this person really understands, you know, what I'm working on. They see the, they see, you know, my vision. Um, those are your early adopters. And then I would just really focus on those guys and really use them too for feedback because um, you now have kind of a friendly friendly opinion uh, in the industry that you're in. And so you can use those early adopters to set your initial pricing, uh, run them through future iterations. Um, they're usually way more patient. So they might even pay you for you know, the first year of your technology when it's, again, looking a little embarrassing um, or your UI isn't super shiny yet um, and not have a problem with it. Also, Catherine, this is Caroline. We had talked a little bit before you went on about um, university resources and how those were able to help you at the beginning. And coming from a university, I'm very interested to hear your story about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that there's kind of two schools of thoughts around when to start a company. And I think they're both very valid. One of them is, yeah, started in college, which I'll talk about in a second. The other one is, dude, go work a, go work a job, figure out who you actually are, build some expertise uh, and knowledge, and then go start a company. And I think both of them uh, make a ton of sense. Um, I decided to go the college route for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of them actually is that I was think, you know, I, might want to start a family in the future and uh, thinking about what, you know, if it takes eight years to to grow a company, uh, then I need to think about, you know, what the timeline looks like in its college, uh, if, 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 if I really wanted to kind of be stable uh, by that time. That was one one thing. And then the second thing was that college is kind of a playground. So it, it's designed for you to make mistakes, try new things. And so starting something in college, there's really no risk there. Um, you're kind of on a ramen diet anyway to begin with. So I used a ton of university resources. Um, a lot of them were pitch competitions. So I went to dozens of pitch competitions. Uh, like I said, my first half a million bucks was just uh, like piecemeal. It started with like a few hundred dollars to start. Then I started going to bigger competitions. Um, uh, eventually won like a few 100 to $200,000 prizes. Uh, and I think it really helped to solidify the pitch. Uh, a lot of people listened to what I was talking about. And so I was able to get all sorts of feedback. And then also I used uh, the professors uh, at Penn a lot. Uh, so anytime I had ideas on what to do, I would go straight to them, especially on the technological side um, for consulting. Um, and then also resource uh, networking, right? So um, there's a whole wealth of connections uh, through any alumni network. Um, and that has really truly been the best way that I found uh, to raise capital is going through alumni networks. I kind of have a follow on question. So uh, you talked about your professors. Can you cite any, any um, uh, very specific uh, uh, engagement that you had with either professors or other business leaders in a mentorship role? And have you considered yourself now potentially pivoting to being a mentor yourself? Yeah, so uh, I was literally at Penn yesterday actually talking to some classes there. So um, there's a professor there that teaches entrepreneurship. His name is Jeffrey Babin, and he works alongside another professor, uh, Thomas Castle, and they teach entrepreneurship there. Uh, they're like my godparents almost at this point. So um, they've uh, seen me from my inception. They got me my first introduction to a uh, packing customer. They've reviewed tons of decks. Um, there's uh, some angel groups that are uh, pen based that also uh, kind of mentored me all, all throughout the process. I have a personal mentor of mine, Eric Lynn, um, who I met through a female founder networking um, 
program. Um, and he's kind of been the one that has always represented my interest uh, instead of the company's interest. And it's so interesting having someone like that on the cap table. Um, and he's the one that I call when I'm like in tears, basically not sure how to make a decision. Um, so I've, I personally don't consider myself super intelligent. So I've always relied on uh, having a whole group of, of advisors and mentors um, and kind of learning from their experiences and, and moving forward in, in that direction. Um, in terms of being a mentor myself, I'm, I love talking to entrepreneurs and uh, students or anybody who's looking to start a company. And I think the best thing that I can do is just, again, like share my journey <laughs> in, in the most honest way possible uh, so that hopefully like you learn something from it and maybe don't make the same mistakes that I did. Thank you. A question from YouTube. Who are your competitors and how would you compete against a large corporation with more resources and relationships? Yeah, so traditionally speaking, and, and we look at them as, as you know strategic partners now because we are partnering with a company like this, but uh, traditionally it's been chemicals. Uh, so you can apply uh, treatments to fruits and vegetables that extend their shelf life. Um, and so if, if, you know, theoretically, if an apple could last forever, then you wouldn't need to know the perishability of it. Um, but the reality is that an apple doesn't last forever and no matter what you do to it, it's still gonna go bad. So in general, we're, we're complementary. Um, however, we do kind of compete for the same resources oftentimes. Um, so that's why we we considered a strategic partnership with a company like that. In terms of um, competing with a bigger company in general, I think people underestimate the value of giving a lot of fucks. Um, like there's no one in the entire universe, if you're running a startup, that cares more about the thing that you're doing than you. Um, and so I feel like that works that can go very, very far. Uh, so like if you're negotiating a deal or a contract, um, like thinking through every possible thing that could happen to you or couldn't happen to you, um, thinking through every scenario, um, it, it's it's just very valuable when, when you just care more. I, I feel like you can get pretty far. Um, and we do that with our customers too, right? Like I take, I take it personally when a customer doesn't have a good experience with my product or my company. Um, and so I feel like I just spend more time there. It's not as much of like a business to me. You know, I'm not there necessarily just looking at numbers on a, on an Excel sheet. I want to do a good job. Um, and I think that's oftentimes how startups end up winning out over bigger companies that might not have that personal approach to their business anymore. I, um, first question. So of the fruits you've looked at so far, which have benefited the most from this improved um, system here in terms of spoilage? Yeah, so the, um, the way that we look at our markets and, and what we should address first is we look at the volume um, because that's important. Then we look at the amount of shrink that that product creates. So how much food waste can we address? And then obviously how much it costs, right? Because in order for us to, let's say, if we save one avocado, that's worth more dollars than saving one banana. And so when we factor all those uh, things together, we kind of generate a list of what we should target first. And so those first guys were apples and bananas. Um, up next is absolutely avocados. Uh, then we got tomatoes. We've got kiwis <laughs> after that, uh, and then flowers. So those are kind of like our immediate next targets. And second question is, um, who actually, who owns the data for this? Like are the people who have the sensors, are they allowed to do their independent analyses or? Um, or are they solely relying on you? Yes, yeah, so actually uh, no one's ever asked. Uh, and actually we found that no one really cares. <laughs> so, um, you know, we work with really, really busy people. And the most important thing that we can do is help them make that uh, decision uh, and remove the decision uh, from their plate. So, you know, every time I talk about biosensors or ethylene data or anything like that, usually my customers' eyes glaze over and they're like, look, man, I'm trying to make my life easier, not make my life harder. I don't really want to look at a bunch of graphs all day because I got other stuff to do. So actually no one's really ever asked us that. <laughs> 
So yeah, we own the data. Catherine, as you prepare for your Series B raise, have any of your advisors or supporters shaped or changed your investor pitches or decks based on current investor sensitivities to the economy and inflation? Yeah, and, and apart from just the current status, uh, I always have people with very different opinions. So there are two like billionaires that are, are on my cap table and they, one of them is Mark Cuban and they both have very strong opinions against raising VC capital ever. Um, and they have voiced them to me. They're like, you're never going to get super duper wealthy if you're giving all your company away to people who have already kind of sort of made it. Um, so I always, I, but I welcome the, that type of feedback. I think it's really important uh, in considering uh, whether or not to even go out for a fundraise. I would say in the current economic climate, um, VCs care about revenue, uh, which uh, is a novel concept, I guess, uh, in the last couple of years. I generally think that for the most part, that's a fairly positive thing. Like if I'm just thinking about it, like, or the world, that's probably a good thing that uh, we want to invest in companies that are, you know, making money uh, and not just creating cute pitch decks. Um, but it, it does make it a little bit harder to go out and fundraise. Um, I think this, the strategy has just changed a little bit more to talking about the real nuts and bolts of how this company operates and how it's going to be profitable over necessarily selling like this gigantic vision um, and throwing a ton of money at it. But you always have to balance both of those two things out for sure. Yeah, I have another question for you. Um, so in your like a family, do you, are there other entrepreneurs? Is there anything about like how you were raised or other like role models in your family, whether they're parents or, you know, crazy aunt or <laughs> what have you? I mean, you know, can you talk a little bit about uh, just life experiences in growing up that like led you to here? Yeah, for sure. Well, so my dad's a small business owner. Um, so I kind of grew up with him uh, working on his own thing. Um, he's also super technical, so he can code really well. He's a mechanical engineer, he's electrical engineer. He's kind of like full stack, full stack. Um, so I, I grew up with someone who liked to build stuff. Um, and I think that really, uh, really impacted me. I also think that, well, my parents are, uh, you know, first generation Americans, so they're Russian immigrants, uh, which isn't super popular right now. But um, uh, basically, you know, I kind of grew up as the oldest child with a little bit of uh, kind of pressure to perform, like I wanted to do well for for my family. And so I feel like when I, when I finally got into Penn and, you know, you know, was in this amazing place, I just remembered being like six years old and sitting in an auditorium, um, and the principal looking out at all of us and being like, you kids are the next generation. Like you guys are gonna be the next astronauts and presidents and you guys are gonna be doing such cool stuff. And so I remember when I got into university, I was like, okay, man, like I've had a ton of resources poured into me. So I might as well go out and become an astronaut, you know, like that's my job. Um, and so I think this is kind of my way of, of, of doing that. Very good, thank you. We have a question from YouTube. How do you, and I, sorry if I'm not sure if we've addressed this, how are you protecting your IP and can you prevent a competitor from stealing your technology? Yeah, so we have like a kind of hard protection, if you will, with IP around the way that our sensors work. Um, and so we have patents around that. And we have a whole patent family now around that in a lot of different countries. Um, but on top of that, there are also other types of protections. Um, the main one for us is kind of our approach uh, in our business model that uh, the approach that we take to this food waste problem. Um, so a lot of companies in our space traditionally have picked the largest TAM, uh, which tends to be retail. Um, and they'll say, okay, retailers are the place we're going to make our money, so let's sell to a retailer. Well, oftentimes the solutions require the buy-in from the supplier. Um, and so what ends up happening is the solutions are built for the retailer and they end up hurting the supplier, for example. Um, and so there's no stickiness or traction at the end of the day in the market um, because suppliers are just not bought in. And so a lot of what we focus on is building really strong relationships on both the supplier and the retailer side and building solutions that benefit multiple segments of the supply chain, which can be difficult um, when the interests don't always align. Um, and so that's a big part for us is that we have that 
trust and we have the reputation to be able to have conversations with the buyer and the seller and even sometimes be the intermediate between uh, those two folks. Thank you. How did you meet your co-founders? Is there a story there of how you came together? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I guess like one uh, unsolicited piece of advice would be date before you marry for sure. So uh, your co-founder is not necessarily your drinking buddy. Um, I definitely I've not married, but I think it's more like marriage um, where you're kind of going through sleepless nights together in some of the most stressful moments of your entire life. Um, so you have to think very carefully about who you're working with. And so I definitely encourage that if you're starting to work with someone, instead of having like that equity conversation or signing something away immediately, just say, look, let's work together for a couple months. And then at the end of that time frame, let's see how we feel about each other after that. Um, so I met my co-founder, Jay, at a networking event. Um, I used to go to it because it gave out free drinks. Uh, it sounds like you guys are on the same page with the free lunch. Um, and I started giving my spiel and I was like, did you know an Apple is over a year old? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I've worked with those guys in the past. I'm actually kind of from the ag industry, uh, which was great. He was working on his own thing at the time. Um, but then I had a biochem exam. <laughs> and so I texted this guy that I met and I was like, hey man, you cool flying to Washington? At the time we both lived in Philadelphia would you mind flying to Washington and installing some devices? He's like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Uh, and he did an amazing job. Uh, like those those customers love, to this day, love him. Um, and so at that point I was like, well, maybe we should go ahead and try working together. Um, but I've had a couple of other experiences where I've tried, I've said, met someone, I'm like, wow, I think we would be really great working together. We gave it a couple months and it just didn't work out for whatever reason. Are you finding today's for today's market, uh, for executives and senior talent, making it easier or harder to find such candidates for your startup? Uh, I don't know. Um, I well, I think it's easier for sure because we have like more, like we have more stuff that we can offer, right? Like it's a little bit more legit because uh, at the time, like I wasn't really pulling a salary. I had to tell Jay, who was like. Thir like 30, uh, which was older than me to be, to not take really much of a salary either. So, it, you know, you're really asking someone for a lot uh, at that point. Now, you know, at least I can give someone something. Um, and I also, we have a little bit more traction. So it's not so much an idea um, and just kind of a wild shot. So it's gotten a little easier. At the same time though, I think fundamentally, like you have to trust your gut on stuff. Um, I actually tend to not like to hire people with super fancy resumes. I find that Ivy Leaguers tend to be a little bit too much, not enough bang for your buck, if you will, or resting on your laurels. I usually uh, I usually just go with my instincts on people, um, but certainly have made mistakes in the past, uh, for sure. And it's just a learning experience. Unless there's another question from the room, I think this is our final question. Catherine, we ask every speaker, what book influenced you the most or what are you currently reading that you would recommend? I love reading. Um, I would say my favorite business Grove is in a business book is Andy Grove's High Output Management. He's definitely the OG. I feel like you don't need to read much else. Like you don't need to read John Dewar's book. You don't need to read any of the kind of diluted stuff. Uh, he's definitely like the OG of a lot of thinking, including OKRs and, and other stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. All right, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today and for talking about your startup, Strella. And everyone, that's all we have time for. Um, thank, thank you all for joining, tuning in, and coming. And uh, we really appreciate the fact that uh, Catherine is able to share her wisdom with the group and her experiences. As a reminder, next Friday at noon, we're going to be hearing from Kenny Lee of Agent, and he'll be speaking on the power of purpose-driven startups, how sustainability drives innovation. Sign up for that, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>